Dingai Fusion Records. Chapter 47 Invitation An hour later, Xiang Shu and Chen Xin were like two people who had just been fished out of the waters. The captain gesticulated as he spoke a lot, and Chen Xin could only nod continuously. Xiang Shu sat on the ground beside the captain's room, leaning against a wooden wall as he listened with his eyes closed. This was a trading ship heading south from Gaguryo toward the Yangtze River. Along the way, they would stop at Shangyu first, then continue heading north, pass by Jiankong and Jiaozhou, then circle one round before returning to Pyongyang. Upon departure, it would be filled with ginseng, leather goods, and other such items. When it returned, it would bring back tea, silk, and porcelain from the south to Pyongyang. The captain was a Han. After living for such a long time, it was his first time seeing a monster like Sima Wei. After inquiring for a long time, Chen Xin rambled incoherently about some folk legends, only saying that he was an exorcist while Xiang Shu was his protector, and that the two of them were companions who went around capturing Yao's, then after meeting that Yao in Paikshu Mountain, they were chased all the way here, etc. Fortunately, in the end, they touched the heavens during a critical situation and summoned a divine lightning bolt from above. Save your energy! Xiang Shu finally couldn't bear to listen any further and said impatiently, Aren't you tired? While Chen Xing spoke, he took out the money that he had received after pawning off Sima Wei's helmet and handed it to the captain. That's sort of what had happened. This bit of money for the boat is a humble expression of our goodwill, please let us take your boat. You're exterminating evil on behalf of the people, I won't accept it. I can't accept it. The captain quickly refused and said, If you don't mind, please stay on my boat for a few days first. People at sea are most afraid of storms and the yaws of the legends. With an exorcist who could summon divine lightning around, their journey this time should be very smooth. The captain couldn't be more happy. He quickly arranged a clean room for the two of them to rest in. The ship was carrying a lot of goods, as well as several Pyongyang scholars who were heading south to study. The captain gave Xiang Shu and Chen Xing the best room he could, the room had windows and only one bed. Chen Xing was already very satisfied. The captain continued explaining, this was their first southward voyage this year, which meant a lot to the captain. Even if the weather was stormy, they had to set sail no matter what. The storm was bigger today, but it would be fine after getting onto the open sea and leaving the rainstorm area. He even got people to prepare a stove for the two of them to warm themselves with. Chen Xing had been soaking in the rain for half a day, so both his outer robes and innerwear were thoroughly drenched. When he entered the cabin, he couldn't help sneezing. Chen Xing asked Xiang Shu expectantly, How did you know I was captured? Xiang Shu casually said, I didn't know you were captured. Chen Xing, then why did you? Xiang Shu, I thought you had run off by yourself again, so I gave chase to hit you. Chen Xing. Xiang Shu put the door bolt on the frame, locking it, and started taking his clothes off while motioning to Chen Xing. Take it off ah. Xiang Shu stared at Chen Xing as if he didn't know him. What are you doing just standing there? Chen Xing suddenly felt a little embarrassed. He took off his clothes and threw them to Xiang Shu, then jumped onto the bed, stark naked as he covered himself with a blanket. Xiang Shu didn't try to avoid him. He took off all his clothes until he was completely naked, then wrapped a towel around his waist. He rolled up his clothes, placed them in a basket, then pushed the door out and put them at the entrance. He placed some money inside and instructed the crew on the ship to wash and starch it, then send it back after drying tomorrow. Thus, the two of them had no clothes left and could only face each other openly in the room all day. Xiang Shu Chen Xing asked again. Xiang Shu was taking a bath in the adjacent compartment. He motioned for Chen Xing to go wash up. In the compartment, Chen Xing cheered, There's hot water. This is great. When Chen Xing came out, he realized that some hot food had been sent over, fish and shrimp were stewed in a bowl with a little soy sauce and meat, and there was a vat of hot wine as well. 
Apparently, the captain had ordered those in the mess hall to send it over. Xiang Shu's crotch was covered with a cloth, and he sat there like that as he started pouring a drink for himself. After they had their fill of food and drink, Chen Xin finally felt a little better. He shrank into the inner side of the bed, and his heart actually started pounding wildly. This wasn't his first time facing Xiang Shu so openly, and it wasn't his first time sleeping in the same bed as Xiang Shu, but for some reason, he kept feeling a little embarrassed this time. Xiang Shu glanced at Chen Xin, as if he was a little hesitant too. Sleeping. Chen Xin moved inside again and said, Rest for a while B.A. Even if everything went smoothly, it would take at least half a month for the ship heading on the Yangtze River to arrive at Shangyu. During their journey, he and Xiang Shu could only live together in one room, no, when they were staying in Qi Li Chuan, they ate and lived at the same place too, and there weren't any problems then? Was it because they had to sleep on the same bed? For some reason, the atmosphere in the room suddenly turned a little ambiguous. Xiang Shu took off the cloth towel, then went to bed like that and slept with Chen Xing under the same blanket. Chen Xing accidentally touched Xiang Shu's scorching skin, and they rubbed against each slightly. Chen Xing's heart started beating madly, then he subconsciously pulled back a little. Xiang Shu seemed to sense this awkwardness, so he tried his best to not let the two of them touch while he laid down slowly. Amidst the storm, the ship swayed slightly. This bed was extremely narrow and small. Under the blanket, Xiang Shu stepped on the footboard with one foot to stabilize himself so as not to squeeze Chen Xing against the wall. On the other hand, Chen Xing was trying his best to lean against the wall. I, Chen Xing wanted to start a conversation to distract himself, so he covertly changed his posture as he was afraid of Xiang Shu seeing his body's reaction. Right here, right now, the scorching body temperature under the blanket, the brief sensation just now when their bodies had touched without any barriers between them, instantly made Chen Xing's imagination uncontrollably run wild. Xiang Shu's voice obviously sounded a little awkward. What? You must be tired. Chen Xing turned his head and looked at Xiang Shu. It's okay. Xiang Shu's eyes remained open as he stared at the ceiling in a daze. The ship swayed gently in the storm. The windows weren't closed tight, so cold winds were leaking into the cabin. In this early spring when ice flows were only starting to melt, the weather was freezing. Chen Xing pulled back under the blanket and shivered. When are you going back? Chen Xing remembered now, after their reunion, everything seemed so natural to him that he even forgot to ask Xiang Shu about Karakoram and Qi Li Chuan. Xiang Shu didn't reply. Chen Xing thought. It's my fault again, I made you rush thousands of miles here just to save me. After the ship heads south, you won't know when you can go back again. Did you, tell your tribesmen? Chen Xing asked. What? Xiang Shu just replied indifferently. About coming to save me? No, Xiang Shu casually answered. What about Xiao Shan? Chen Xing asked again. Sent him back. Xiang Shu said. But I don't know if the Xiang Nu can handle him. Chen Xing, then, you'll be heading to the south with me. Xiang Shu turned his body slightly and changed his posture, answering, depends. Chen Xing fell silent for a moment before saying, just now, I was just casually saying that in front of the captain, don't mind it too much. Xiang Shu. Xiang Shu glanced at Chen Xing, baffled. He understood what Chen Xing meant, that he had introduced Xiang Shu as a protector without seeking his opinion, so Chen Xing was afraid that he would be angry again. Thank you. Chen Xing said with a smile, although I don't know what you think of me, I thought you wouldn't come find me anymore. Why? Xiang Shu asked instead. Is that how you see me? Chen Xing rushed to explain, you're the great Chen Yua, you have your responsibilities so you can't be blamed for going back. Xiang Shu, what I want to say is, if you don't mind. Xiang Shu frowned a little and looked at Chen Xing. 
Chen Xing mustered up his courage and finally said what was on his mind. Even though Xiang Shu had rejected him once, this time, they were probably more familiar with each other than before, and for Xiang Shu, they had the same goal, so. I promise, it won't take too long, Chen Xing said with slight apprehension. Can you, accompany me like this for a period of time? I won't say anything about being a protector or whatnot, but I know that just by relying on myself alone, I probably won't be able to. Ever since I was a child, Xiang Shu suddenly turned his head and didn't look at Chen Xing anymore. He slowly said, I knew that one day, I would become the sixteen who's great Chen Yu. Chen Xing Chen Xing stared at Xiang Shu in a daze. His nose bridge, lips and the contours of his side profile were all exquisitely perfect, yet it didn't seem to be the result of cosmetics at all. Instead, he had a kind of masculine comeliness. Xiang Shu's brows furrowed a little before he continued. After my father passed away, I naturally shouldered the burden of being the great Chan Yu. My tribesmen's affairs are my affairs, and the calamities they face are my calamities as well. Chen Xing said, Yes, so I was thinking that you'll have to return someday. Even if you are willing, I can't hog. Then one day, Xiang Shu continued. You came to find me, and told me that you need a protector, and that I'm that protector. So this responsibility expanded from being responsible for Qi Li Chuan to being responsible for the whole world. Chen Xing said helplessly, I don't want to either, but... Xiang Shu, but throughout this entire process, no one ever asked me what I wanted to do. Chen Xing. Never, Xiang Shu said seriously. They never asked me, Shulu Kong, are you willing to become the great Chan Yu? And you never asked me if I was willing to be your protector. After he spoke, Xiang Shu frowned again, then turned his head sideways to look at Chen Xing, as if he wanted to find the answer from observing Chen Xing's expression. His furrowed brows relaxed, then he raised an eyebrow at Chen Xing. Chen Xing, I understand now, Xiang Shu. Speaking of that, Chen Xing suddenly smiled and said, So that's what it was, you thought I didn't respect you. That's my fault, at that time. I really didn't think much about that. Xiang Shu, I'm different from you, you want to be an exorcist. Of course not. This time, it was Chen Xing who interrupted him. If I could choose, I think. I wouldn't be one this willingly ba. I admit, in the beginning, I never thought of respecting your wishes, but I would like to explain myself too, I'm the same, and there are a lot of things that I have to do. I have no other choice. Then why do you want to be an exorcist? Xiang Shu asked, slightly puzzled. Can't you be your own person? I do, I want to be myself too, and I often ask, why me? Chen Xing recalled the first time he tried to control the yin-yang mirror, the voice he heard in his heart. But my father often said when he was alive, how can there be so many people in this world who can do whatever they want? In this life, those who can live according to their wishes are the blessed ones. There are a lot more people who are just living while complying to the mandate of heaven with burdens they must bear. Admittedly, it is very unfair, but looking at it from another perspective, can't this be the expectations that the heavens have given to each and every one of us? Expectations. Xiang Shu said with disapproval. It's merely resignation. Chen Xing understood why Xiang Shu refused to be a protector at the very beginning now. He said, with relief, so to speak, we're just resigning ourselves to the so-called will of heaven. The ship swayed with the waves. The rain seemed to have stopped and only the sounds of waves crashing one after another could be heard. Chen Xing and Xiang Shu lay side by side quietly. For a while, no one spoke. Then what do you want to do? Chen Xing felt like his understanding of Xiang Shu was being renewed. Now, he suddenly felt like their conversation was very peaceful, it was a peace that came from deep within their hearts. After abandoning everything in the outside world, they were looking at each other as equals to understand the most sincere side of the other party. 
Sometimes, Xiang Shu said. I want my mother to come back to life, and for my father to come back to life, then live together beyond the Great Wall like before. Chen Xin couldn't help but glance at Xiang Shu, but Xiang Shu had his eyes closed. But things don't turn out the way you want. They're all dead. Xiang Shu muttered, My aunt is dead too, everyone's gone, just like a banquet held during the Autumn Close Festival. After everyone finishes drinking, they'll all say goodbye and go where they should. And what I want is easy to say, yet also very difficult. What I want is just for this banquet to never end. Xiang Shu was in a daze for a while. He recalled the day he bid farewell to his tribesmen who were staying in Karakoram, but he didn't tell Chen Xing any more details. This conversation appeared meaningless, but for Chen Xing, it seemed to mark the beginning of another stage of his life that didn't have much time left. Just like a ship that left the storm, it finally sailed onto a calm and tranquil sea. Those who knew me said I was sad at heart. Those who did not know me said I was seeking for something. Oh distant and azure heaven! By what man was this brought about? Chen Xing sang softly as the ship rocked. What about you? Xiang Shu asked. Chen Xing said hesitantly, Perhaps, I want to tour the Divine Land? Go to the places I've read about in books, yet never had the chance to visit. After he spoke, the future Chen Xing imagined seemed to become clearer. After visiting all the mountains, rivers, and seas, I'll go to the Yangtze River and find a picturesque place to stay in. I'll plant wisteria flowers in my yard, and when the flowers bloom, Chen Xing smiled sadly as he said, I'll be able to read books under the flower rack, do you like that? If there's a chance, you're welcome to come visit my house. It's okay if you want to stay and not leave too, if there's a chance, n, as long as there's a chance. Chen Xing raised his hand, the faint light of the heart lamp emitting from his palm. He gently pressed it against Xiang Shu's bare chest under the blanket, and at that moment, the heart lamp's strength corresponded to Xiang Shu's firm and powerful heartbeat, and a bright light penetrated through the blanket. Chen Xing said, Xiang Shu, I'd like to ask you this once more, properly. Xiang Shu continued staring at Chen Xing. Before the future comes, Chen Xing said. Can you accompany me for a while? No matter what, I need you. I know now that you are not willing to be dictated by responsibility. I just wanted to ask, if you were given a choice once more, could you? I'll consider it, Xiang Shu answered. Chen Xing smiled. He knew that by saying that, it meant that Xiang Shu agreed. The storm receded. The ship sailed along the seas. A bright moon illuminated the world. Winds blew strongly, making the ship set off at full sail towards the silver white sea. Chen Xing whispered in the tranquility, Sometimes, I feel like this so-called responsibility means that there's someone out there who needs you. Whether it's the divine land, the earth, the common people, or all living things, this sort of need will never offer any repayment, but we would always willingly do our utmost in fulfilling those expectations, just like how any other person would when they're needed by another person. Isn't that kind of feeling pretty good? Xiang Shu didn't reply. Chen Xing curled up under the blanket. After a long time passed, he thought that Xiang Shu should have fallen asleep. Are you cold? Xiang Shu asked. Nope. The blanket on Chen Xing's side was slightly damp, which made him feel a little uncomfortable, so he kept shivering. Xiang Shu said, Come closer. So Chen Xing leaned towards Xiang Shu's side and instantly felt warmer. Then, a wave hit, and the ship tilted a little. Xiang Shu withdrew his feet and hugged Chen Xing, who had been pushed into his embrace. Chen Xing's entire body was leaning against Xiang Shu in his arms, and his breathing immediately sped up. His lower body pulled back a little so as not to make things too awkward for the both of them. The waves crashed one after another pushing him repeatedly towards Xiang Shu. Chen Xing wanted to stabilize his body, so he raised his hand, but didn't have anywhere he could place it. After a while, 
he simply put it on Xiang Shu's shoulder and hugged him around his neck, and the two of them were now stuck to each other. Got it, Xiang Shu said in the end. Chen Xing didn't hear that. He fell asleep very quickly. Xiang Shu's body was quite warm, so he couldn't help but want to stick closer to him. However, he could sense that Xiang Shu was always squirming about restlessly, as if he was all fidgety from being tormented by Chen Xing. He would keep waking up intermittently, and after a while, he couldn't care much anymore and simply let go of his restraints and embraced Chen Xing. The next morning, when Chen Xing woke up, he saw his clothes folded neatly next to the pillow while he was covered with a new blanket. Chen Xing Chen Xing was very sure that the blanket had been changed once. The bed today was obviously different from yesterday's. Xiang Shu Chen Xing said. Xiang Shu? Where is he? After he had breakfast, Chen Xing found Xiang Shu on the deck. Xiang Shu had changed into his clothes and was having tea with the captain while sitting. The sea breeze blew, and the sun shone bright. Why did the blanket? I don't know. Xiang Shu said impatiently. Wow, Chen Xing stood before the mast as he faced the vast sea. Xiang Shu nodded at the captain before going back to the cabin with Chen Xing, then threw a bundle at Chen Xing for him to look at. Inside were the two magic treasures that Xiang Shu had brought along with him from Karakoram, the Yin Yang Mirror and the Zhang Drum, as well as the medical supplies that King Akele had given them the four ruler seals. Upon seeing those objects, Chen Xing started missing their owner and couldn't help feeling a bit upset. After a round of inspection, he carefully kept them, then looked at the bundle that Xiang Shu had packed in a hurry. There was a Qiang flute and a long, narrow unlocked box inside. He opened up the box. Inside were two pieces of sheepskin scrolls that were rolled up together, it seemed to be tied together with a woolen rope, and the paper seemed quite old, suffused with a light purple color. Was this the great Chanyu golden conferment of purple scroll that Fujian had always yearned for? Chen Xing thought about the saying of the golden conferment of purple scroll, but after looking it over, he thought it didn't seem like it. This sheepskin didn't have blood on it. However, he restrained his curiosity and didn't rummage through Xiang Shu's belongings. After closing the box, he put it back, and he had just done so when Xiang Shu came back. What do we do after reaching Shang Yu? Xiang Shu asked. Chen Xing said, Go to Jiankong and find my Shifu's friend. Do you remember the two other pictures in Zhang Liu's book? Xiang Shu showed Chen Xing, when he was in Qi Li Chuan, he had roughly restored the three pictures. There are many capable people in the south. After the large-scale migration to the south, a large number of ancient texts had been preserved. Although many exorcist families abandoned the profession after the silence of all magic and either became scholars or farmers, they still knew a little about the past. Chen Xing had to go warn Xian first then gather the former exorcists to discuss countermeasures and search for the whereabouts of the Dingai Pearl. What are you writing? Xiang Shu saw that Chen Xing had been writing letters for the past few days in the cabin. Chen Xing said, Visitation cards. I'll get people to deliver it to post stations that will send it to Jiankong. My father had many students in the past, and they were all my seniors. After the large-scale migration to the south, they submitted to Great Jin one after another. We might be able to seek refuge with them for the time being. We'll at least have a place to stay in the city then. Xiang Shu casually remarked, N, I forgot, your father was a great scholar. After returning to the south, you're naturally the descendant of a prestigious family. Chen Xing heard the ridicule in his tone and retorted, You flatter me, compared to the great Chan Yu, how could this be worth anything? What else can we do? We've finished spending all the money we have, so will we be going cold and hungry after getting off the ship? Xiang Shu said, there must be a few more Yuanzins waiting in Jiankong. You, Chen Xing really wanted to throw his pen. Chen Xing initially had the notion of trying his luck, but after Xiang Shu said that, he didn't want to continue writing anymore. But in the end, 
he still forced himself to write out his itinerary, then sealed the cards, and paid with the little bit of money he had left to get someone to deliver it ashore and take it to the Ministry of Personnel in Jiankong. Normally, if the letter had been received, then there should be a post station staff, but along his journey, no one came to meet him. He thought that it was easy for people's hearts to change so he could only submit to fate. He would think of a way to get some money after arriving at Jiankong VA. As the ship sailed south, the weather gradually warmed up. It was sunny, and the skies were clear in spring. People became more lazy when they reached the Yangtze River region. Chen Xing just slept in the cabin all day, tossing and turning in bed. Sometimes, Xiang Shu would play chess with the captain on deck, while at other times, he would buy books after getting off the ship and read them on the journey slash aboard to kill time. Nearly ten days later, the ship smoothly sailed into the Yangtze River and headed towards Jiankong along the canal. Another half a day later, in the morning, they arrived at Jiankong city ahead of time. Chen Xing was still sleeping. The faint sounds of music traveled over from the outside, followed by the shouting of the boatman. Coming, coming a boatman said. Chen Xing turned over. Won't we only be arriving at night? We reached Jiankong so soon? Xiang Shu pushed the door open and entered the room, already having had packed his things. He studied Chen Xing with a look of impatience. Chen Xing sat up, his hair all messy, then scratched his head as he looked at Xiang Shu. Someone's picking you up at the dock, Xiang Shu said. Chen Xing perked up, then ran out as he said, Who? Who came to pick me up? The ship had arrived at the dock. What greeted them were peach blossoms and willow trees, the entire city was lush with gorgeous flowers. Thousands of vermilion eaves and tiles shone with a clean luster. Zhongshan has the imposing grandeur of a coiling dragon and stood as mighty as a crouching tiger. A misty drizzle fell over the Ten Mile Hawaii River. In the distance, both Taishu and Xiaoming palaces were like reflections in a mirror reflected by the Suanwu Lake, just like celestial palaces enveloped in a misty fog. The number one capital in the world, after experiencing many trials and hardships, there were already millions of people living in Jiankong City. This was the place where Han culture flourished the most, and it was also the center of the Divine Land's civilization. Close to fifty scholars were holding up umbrellas in a line. Somewhere high above, a gentleman dressed in a robe with wide sleeves walked over amidst the song as if he was riding the wind. Upon my leaving, wept the willow, someone sang on the bank, upon my return, sweep rain and snow. Both sides of that man's temples were frosty white and he looked to be about forty years old. He wore black official muslin with a snow-white scholar robe inside, his beautiful face as fair as jade, and his smile made people feel as if they were being bathed in a spring breeze. With a refined manner, he wore a jade plaque that hung from his waist, fox teeth around his neck, wooden clogs, and a jade flute in his hands. His belt fluttered in the wind as he walked over with a confident gait. A friend has come from afar. Xian said in a loud voice. Would you like to have a meal? Little Shidi, this way please. End of Volume 2, Kangsheng Yuli Dingai Fusion Records Chapter 48 Welcome Reception In Huanmo Palace A scholar held a glass bowl in one hand, filled with viscous blood. The blood seemed to be alive, slowly wiggling at the moment. On the platform before him lied the burnt body of Sima Wei. Not far away, there were three balls of blazing black flames, inside the flames, Chang'an, Xiang Yang, and a verdant mountain could be seen. How is the plan proceeding? the devil god in the center asked. Very smoothly, the scholar replied. The heart sneered. Very smoothly? The three important weapons the Yin Yang mirror, the Zhang drum, and the dear Christaff have all fallen into the enemy's hands. Zhou Zhen lost his life, while the resentment we spent so much effort to gather in Yeo Guang, Qiang, and Yuhang have all dissipated as well. Not only did the drought fiend army not increase in number, but it's also getting smaller by the day. 
Two of the eight princes who were supposed to guard the array are gone. Wang Hai, is this what you mean by smoothly? The scholar called Wang Hai answered earnestly, My lord, you need not worry. He tilted the glass bowl in his hand slightly. The blood was like a viscous paste that fell onto Sima Wei's remains, wriggling as it seeped in and began repairing his body for him. At the very least, they have not discovered the Ten Thousand Spirits Array so far, Wang Hai replied with confidence. Although the number of troops in our drought fiend army has sharply reduced, we can transform as many of them we want in the future. There are humans everywhere. At present, we should curb ourselves and lay low, only then will their vigilance not be easily aroused. As for the three demonic weapons, we can just retrieve them again next time. The seven ten thousand spirits arrays will be activated as scheduled. The heart uttered a disdainful humph. Wang Hai watched Sima Wei's body being repaired and murmured, The exorcists think themselves clever, deluding themselves into thinking that they can control the magic treasures of the world with the chi of slaughter brought about by the weapons. However, what they don't know is that they will end up falling victim to their ingenuity. Resentment will eventually come back to bite them one day, my lord. As Sima Wei's body that had been burnt into a crisp by lightning was being restored, Wang Hai turned around and walked towards the giant heart. The war in the north clued me into an important hypothesis. If this speculation proves to be true, the magic treasure that will reconstruct your body for you at the eye of the array in the divine land will be a treasure never seen before, so you won't need to use the heart lamp anymore. The heart didn't reply, as if in doubt. Wang Hai said, My lord, please, take a look at this. The Dingai Pearl that you have been searching for more than 300 years might have already appeared. Wang Hai shook his sleeve, and a small copper clock about the size of his palm appeared in his hand. Along with a ringing dang, black flames appeared all around his body, and a fantastical scene appeared in front of him. In the world of ice and snow, at the bank of Zarascal River a few months ago, numerous crows landed quietly around the Akele's tribe's campsite. One of them turned towards a tent. Xiang Yuin's son, where where is he? The heart immediately started beating faster, and the entire Huanmo palace was filled with a magenta light. Another black flame burst forth, within which appeared the figures of Xiang Shu, Chen Xing, King Akele, and the consort within the royal tent. When did she go to Lake Barkle? Twenty-two years ago, it happened before you were born, King Akele's consort could be heard saying. The first time I met her, she was heading north, saying that she wanted to find someone. Amen. Bring this woman to me, the devil god heart said. Wang Hai replied, she is the Akele's tribe's consort, but she has already died. She was killed by Che Lufeng, and her corpse had been burned to ashes by the exorcist. Idiot. The devil god heart was almost roaring. Three hundred years. A whole three hundred years. We finally found a clue. My lord, please rest assured, Wang Hai said. Xiang Yuin is Shola Kong's mother, and the answer is on the verge of disclosure. Next, I will put in my utmost to search for the Dingai Pearl. If my humble expectations are proven true, then your brand new body will possess an immense power that even the ancient gods can't match. Even the final ending of the Battle of Bonkin can be rewritten. Suddenly, the heart burst out into raucous, frenzied laughter. March in Jiankong. Willows were abound, the cries of spring birds rang out. A gentle breeze started blowing. The palace rooms were bright, and the beauty of the imperial courtyard was divine. Chen Xing's first thought when he went ashore was, I'm finally home. The Jiankong in front of him really possessed the beauty described in an excerpt of Bangu's Rhapsody of the Two Capitals. The ritual officers order the ceremonies. And the imperial entourage then exits. And then. They raise the wail. And strike the engraved bell. The emperor mounts the jade carriage. Hitches the seasonal dragons. The phoenix canopy hangs lush and luxuriant. Crossbar and Symerg bells jingle and jangle. The imperial officers follow like shadows. In a splendid display of dignity and decorum. 
it had been nearly 70 years since the disaster of Yangjia that had ravaged the central plains. The Han people had migrated south, bringing with them the flourishing scenery of two capitals Chang'an and Luoyang. It seemed like all the officials of the Jin government clasped a magnificent picture scroll under their arm when they came, then unhurriedly spread them towards the Yangtze River's bank. This picture scroll instantly unfurled as if it had a life of their own, so thousands of years of a splendid cultural heritage reappeared in all its glory. Ever since the Wu's era, Jiankong had been the abode of the emperor. When Sima Yan, the emperor of Jin, unified the world, Sun Hao, the emperor of Wu, capitulated and surrendered the city. Jiankong had never experienced war, and now, there were millions of families living in the city. The large-scale migration to the south brought books, as well as farming technology. It introduced poems, books and paintings, and also the technique of casting. As of now, Jiankong City, which was located at Huai River with its east side facing Mount Zhong, had become the center of the Divine Land. Along with the western cities Banchenge, Moling, and Fuxi, Danyang County in the south, Lanja County and other such cities, then expanding to the Divine Land 10,000 miles southwards from the Yangtze River, it encompassed all of the salt, iron, coal and silk in the world. You would find one market every hundred steps, and one city every ten miles. Medical treatment, medication, books, paintings, music and entertainment, trade and commerce, as well as numerous artisans were all extremely prosperous. Since the Qin and Han dynasties, the Jiangnan region has been a land of fish and rice. Books and ink were expensive, while grain and rice were cheap. At that time, under Fujian's rule, one dough of rice in the north cost 12 yuan, while one dough of rice in Jiankong cost 3 yuan. It was even more populous and affluent than a heavenly province like Bashu. No one would die of hunger, and bran and grain were used to feed livestock. If every county had a bumper crop, there would be so much grain that they would be left to rot in a storehouse and feed the rats. Such a low price for rice naturally provided for numerous families and traders. In the early years of the Taiyuan dynasty, there were many talented people in the south. Including the scholars from the large-scale migration, in addition to the local scholars, there were now nearly a total of 100,000 scholars idling their time away out of the millions of families in the city. The Jin government no longer had any official positions they could offer, so the scholars could only discuss politics all day to while their time away. It was Xiang Shu's first time formally entering the world of the Hans, and he was instantly stunned. He had heard of the South that the Hus talked about, but it was even more glorious than in the stories. After Xian received the two of them, he purposely drove Chen Xing and Xiang Shu along the Qinhua River in an open-top carriage for a tour of the city as they made their way to their lodging. When Chen Xing saw Xiang Shu's gaze, he knew that he had been shaken by Jiang Kang's atmosphere so he felt a slight inexplicable sense of pride. It was Chen Xing's first time here, and even he was a little surprised. I received your letter on the way and guessed that you would arrive today, so I came to welcome you, though it might have been a little presumptuous, Xian said with a smile. It's not. It's not presumptuous at all. Chen Xing was very satisfied, Xian truly hadn't been presumptuous in the slightest and the welcome reception he arranged was grand enough, such that he could show off a little to Xiang Shu. He was very pleased. But he suddenly realized that the scholars who welcomed them seemed to look at him and Xiang Shu with two different gazes. The gaze with which they looked at Chen Xing was filled with curiosity and appreciation, while the gaze with which they looked at Xiang Shu was full of amazement and admiration. When they boarded the carriage, he heard people discuss in whispers, such a beautiful man actually exists. You guys are too loud. Chen Xing said in annoyance. I can hear everything. Little Shi Di, how is Jian Kong compared to Chang'an? Xian changed the topic as he asked casually. Um, Chen Xing was a little baffled. He said, Oh right, I wanted to ask this when I got off the ship. Lord Xian, when did we become fellow disciples? Chen Xing kept trying to recollect that. Xian had studied under the famous scholar, Huan Yi, 
who didn't seem to have studied under the same teacher as Chen Xing's father, Chen Zhe. If one must insist on it, perhaps it was because they were both scholars? Chivalrous Bailey once promised to accept me as a disciple. Xian said with a smile, you were still young at that time, so you probably forgot about it. That happened. Chen Xing's doubts just shot through the roof. He did have a shikshan called Wang Meng, but he didn't recall his shifu accepting Xian as a disciple. But since Xian insisted on that, just let him address him as such ba, he wouldn't lose anything from it anyway. Xiang Shu glanced at Xian. Chen Xing then said with a casual smile, although Fu Jian does govern Chang'an quite well, it still falls short in comparison to Jian Kong. How could it just be considered short? Chang'an wouldn't even be able to catch up with Jian Kong even if it urged its horse to gallop at full speed. Fu Jian's disadvantage resulted because the previous few northern monarchs, Lu Yuan, Ran Min, Shi Chang, and the rest had killed too many people and chased all the Hans away. As a result, Chang'an was destitute when he took over, so could only build it up from scratch. Chen Xing explained a little, meaning to say that Xian's identity was not that of an exorcist. Xiang Shu didn't respond and just shifted his gaze to the houses by the street. One of the rows along the way had hundreds of large houses that were a lot more impressive than Tuobayan's house in Chang'an. Chen Xing felt like the buildings in Jiankong were much more luxurious than Chang'an as well, so he asked, What is this place? I don't know, Xian casually replied. These are houses belonging to those who are less well off, please don't mind it. We live in Wei Lane. Chen Xing. Xiang Shu. Xian was over 40, but he was very well maintained. A few wisps of beard hung from his chin, and he carried an ancient jade pendant tied at his waist. Unlike the excessive Hu who liked to hang all sorts of accessories over their bodies, everything on him seemed to be just right. He would always smile while engaging in discourse as well. Usually, when men reached his age and still bore the temperament of a 20 or 30 year old, they could only rely on two things if they still wanted to be young and handsome, studying and money. This brother. I'm mute, Xiang Shu said coldly. Just when Chen Xing was feeling awkward, Xian suddenly burst out laughing. He seemed as if he wanted to pat Xiang Shu's shoulder, but he paid special attention to not touch his body, then said with a smile, great music has the faintest notes, and a man of great wisdom often appears slow-witted. These are the principles of the world. Chen Xing looked at Xian's movements and knew that Xian realized that Xiang Shu was a Hu. Hu men didn't like being touched on their shoulders. Immediately after, Xian seemed to fall deep into thought. He glanced at Chen Xing, his gaze deep and abstruse. Xiang Shu is my protector, Chen Xing explained. Looks like your journey has been very smooth, Xian said approvingly. Sort of. I guess. Chen Xing didn't know if he should cry or laugh and said, This really fits the saying, Life is too short, it's a long story. Xian continued, Shikshang's guessing that you probably have to linger for quite a while in Jiankong, so take your time in recounting the tale, don't worry. Come, we've arrived, let's hold a welcome reception for you first. The carriage had arrived outside Wei Lane, only to see that the door was very small. Its lintel was a half jong long jade from Mount Kun. On the vermilion door were two Xia characters, which were written in a straight and elegant manner. Chen Xing couldn't help exclaiming in admiration. Xian then turned around while smiling and said, Yu Jun? My Shidi is praising you for your beautiful handwriting. Following behind Xian was the person who wrote the words for Xian, called Wang Zizi. He immediately clasped his hands together to modestly decline the flattery, then said, I'll go home for a change of clothes first. I'll come over later for tea. The Wang residence was located right opposite the Xie residence. Chen Xing cheerfully entered the Xian. Xian had assumed an official position in the imperial court and had purchased this residence himself, so he didn't stay with the rest of the Xie family. The scholars who had welcomed him entered the Xie residence in an orderly manner. The door wasn't big, but after entering, it became very spacious. 
It had everything, from pavilions to ponds and rockery. The main part of the residence occupied an area of several mu. One would not have been able to tell that there was so much space beyond a small door. Xian first arranged rooms for Chen Xing and Xiang Shu to rest in, then he invited him to have tea in the main hall. Xiang Shu surveyed his surroundings. Chen Xing came over and knocked on the door. The two of you are very familiar with each other. Xiang Shu asked with a frown. No, Chen Xing admitted with a smile. He knew what Xiang Shu was thinking for him to offer such warm hospitality, he must be scheming something and after connecting it to what Chen Xing had experienced in Chang'an, Xiang Shu would have to be somewhat on guard. Chen Xing explained, when I was studying in Mount Hua, he came to visit once. He had also mentioned that if any need arises, he would be willing to support us in any way he can. Chen Xing once saw Xie and talked to his Shifu. After that, he heard from his Shifu that Xie and had personally gone to their doorstep to find him. This man had always liked roaming about in the mountains and forests and visiting famous rivers and mountains. He was also filled with yearning for strange legends like cultivating, flying on swords, and capturing yaos. Regrettably, Xian was not from an exorcist family. After the silence of all magic, there was no more mana in the world, and a lot of exorcism stories turned into legends. His great undertaking of searching for cultivators in seclusion had grown more and more impossible as he grew older, but fortunately one day, he found Mount Hua. Originally, with the enthusiasm of wanting to become an exorcist, Xian expressed his willingness to do all he could to support the restoration of the exorcism department to Chen Xing's Shifu. Before Chen Xing descended the mountain, his Shifu wrote a letter, which obtained Xian's support very quickly. Not only that, but when he and his Shifu were cultivating in Mount Hua, what they usually ate or used in their daily lives required money. Chen Xing's Shifu was called Bailey Lun, and he said that he was an assassin who was the recipient of the Chen family's grace. But assassins ma, how could they farm and till the land? They could only kill corrupt officials once in a while for the common people, which wouldn't earn them a lot, so he ended up racking up a considerable debt instead. Xian came to visit once, and after learning that Bailey Lun and Chen Xing were hard pressed for money, he dipped into his own pockets and paid off their debts without saying a word, and there was even a lot left over. After that, Shifu even praised Chen Xing a lot, but also added that I up at her entering his fate was truly exceptional, so it left a very deep impression on Chen Xing, and he remembered that Xian had given his Shifu 3,000 tails of silver. Xiang Shu, he wants to become an exorcist. Chen Xing said, it's a beautiful kind of yearning, I guess. That one would have when they're young, like wanting to be chivalrous, fly around on swords, not be tied down by the secular world, capture and exorcise yaos, and fight against injustice. After Chen Xing was reminded by Xiang Shu about this, he thought that Xian was a little overly enthusiastic as well but he had nothing worth Xian scheming for. If Xian was part of Shi Has group, since he knew who his Shifu was and where their sect was located, he could have plotted against him long ago and needn't have had to wait until now. Let's go B.A. Chen Xing now felt a little suspicious as well after hearing Xiang Shu, so he could only say, we can only see what he says. The scholars in the hall have already been waiting for Chen Xing long ago. After the two of them settled down, Xian first introduced his nephew Xie Xian, followed by Wang Zizi and the sons and nephews in the Wang family. With so many people coming up to him all of a sudden, Chen Xin couldn't remember who was who and could only greet them one by one politely. The host raised his cup of tea, and everyone else started having tea. The tea was served in a large bowl, yet you could practically see the bottom of the bowl. On the side was a small snack served with the tea. Chen Xing thought that Xiang Shu was probably cursing inwardly that the Han served such a small cup of tea that wouldn't even suffice for one gulp. After everyone had tea, they started socializing. Chen Xing first talked about his sect and Shifu, then everyone focused on Xiang Shu again. May I know, what's the name of this beautiful man? People in the world have always judged others by their appearances. From the moment Chen Xing came ashore, 
people have been sneaking glances at Xiang Shu from time to time. Along the way, no matter if they were men, women, old or young, everyone couldn't help sparing him a few more glances. The younger generation of the Wang and Xie family saw how handsome Xiang Shu looked and the big sword on his back, which made him look like a chivalrous swordsman, so they naturally formed a favorable impression of him and wanted to ingratiate themselves with him. However, Xiang Shu has always been sitting next to Xian, so it wasn't convenient to do so. They kept trying to send him signals through their gazes, but Xiang Shu just treated it as if he didn't see it. Presently, it was finally time for Chen Xing to formally introduce him, so everyone sat upright and still and smiled at Xiang Shu. He's my. Chen Xing saw that Xiang Shu didn't seem to have the slightest intention of speaking, so he could only introduce him on his behalf. He had wanted to fabricate an origin for him, explaining he's my protector, from the Xiang family in Kuiji. But when he was about to say it, he stopped for some reason. He recalled how Xiang Shu had mentioned his concerns about his background, and in this respect, Chen Xing felt like he understood what Xiang Shu thought. Thus, he respected his wishes and changed his words, He's my Hu friend, surname Shulu, name Kong. From under Qi Li Chuan's Tile tribe. The entire hall fell silent in an instant. Xiang Shu was a little surprised and glanced at Chen Xing, but there seemed to be a hint of a smile in his eyes. His lips moved slightly, and he mouthed something. Chen Xing understood he was mouthing the words thank you. When Xian heard that, he knew that it wasn't good and quickly shot a glance at Chen Xing. As of now, the Hu and Han still bore great enmity against each other. The scholars of Yangtze River hated the Hu war prisoners of the north so much that they could feed on their flesh and sleep on their skin, yet Chen Xing poked stabbed right through the hornet's nest once he was here? How could that be anything good? Sure enough, the silence only lasted for about three breaths before the hall broke out into an uproar. What? Ahu. How did Ahu get in? And he's a tile too. Report him. Report him to the officials now. Xiang Shu frowned slightly and looked at Chen Xing. With his right hand on the hilt of his sword, he swept a glance through the hall. Someone looked as if they had been greatly humiliated and got up, wanting to leave. But there were also people who just frowned slightly as they didn't mind the fight between the Hu and Han that much and just wanted to see how Chen Xing would resolve the crisis he was facing. Chen Xing didn't expect that everyone's reactions would be so much more intense than he had imagined. He immediately smacked his palm on the table and said, Wait. Everyone, please stop. The scholars had already stood up. A flurry of thoughts sped through Xian's mind, and just when he was about to step in to persuade, he saw that Chen Xing took the initiative to speak. So he stopped. End chapter.